Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to see a big crowd. A uh, quick survey. I, I know some people asked it again, but I wasn't looking at the time. How many of you all are in the federal space? Cool. How many in the commercial? And then how many just checking out GitLab and not sure where you work? <laughs> cool. Well, we're going to talk about a story with a federal agency about five years with GitLab uh, DevOps transformation and walk you through this agency that we partnered with, a bit of our story, the history, and then go from there. So quick introductions. My name is Scott Jaffa. I'm an architect focusing on digital transformation. I'm with Validitech's solution engineering and transformation team. We work on modernization with clients. And my focus is a bit more on how people work. So agile, DevOps, SRE, and teaching people how they can deliver better, faster, cheaper. Okay, uh, my name is Slip. I'm a uh, site reliability engineer at Philadelphia Tech. Um, my main responsibilities are um, uh, systems and application deployment, uh, configuration management, um, and um, monitoring and uh, platform stability. Okay. Awesome. And then a little bit about Valida Tech. We're a mature small business working across the federal sector. We try and work on mission critical IT systems, large areas that need reliability, uh, and also transformation. We work in all areas of the federal government from commercial, yeah, from commercial, from civilian to military to some IC. Uh, we've got a little bit in everything. And also, we are a GitLab partner, um, so we're happy to talk to any of y'all about that as well. Uh, so quick agenda, we're going to go through the project, uh, a brief history of the project, uh, a little bit about the approach we took, where we are today, and then Zwe is going to give us a dive into some of the features, including Harold talked about CICD in his last presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about what CICD looks like for Validitech and our customer. So 2014 starting a new project, and we go into the client and they say, hey, build us an enterprise Linux environment. Cool, what do you guys have now? Um, here's a Linux CD. Great, Greenfield, we can propose what we want to do. Um, they asked us to do so. We said there's a lot of DevOps practices that we think will be very valuable. Um, two very key ones are infrastructure as code, where all of the work that we do is software development processes for building out the infrastructure, and then continuous integration to get them the speed and the testing. Again, referencing back to Harold, there's a lot of government controls that he just talked about, so I'm going to skip over that. But you get the idea of the level of work that we need to do. Told our client, gave a proposal, said, cool, go for it. So let's go ahead and get started. We were a small group, uh, just a small team getting started. This is actually GitLab at the time. They were also a small company, about 14 employees when we got started. So when I meet people from GitLab, they're like, oh, hey, did you know so-and-so is the one person in the US at the time working? So we uh, have been working with GitLab a long time, um, grown with them, and we'll kind of talk to that. We decided to go with GitLab a couple of reasons. One, open source. There was the flexibility to modify and, dare I say, hack any little changes that we needed at the time. And they really were flexible. And also, um, the price, the entry at the time in particular, was very low. So it was, a, hey, even if we feel like this isn't going to work, it was a rounding error in our agency's budget, uh, particularly for the small team that we were at the time. So a little bit about what we were looking for. Uh, we said infrastructure as code, so we wanted that merge request workflow. Um, but first and foremost, we needed source code management, place to store all our repositories. That was one of the questions we asked the client. And they had a version control system. Uh, it wasn't going to work for us. So having a source code management that we could do get workflow, merge requests, uh, a couple other features that became valuable. We didn't turn them on on the first day, but the wiki feature for documenting and then some of the task functionality. Uh, we've actually moved to the Atlassian suite for those two for a couple of reasons that we can talk to in questions um, if people are interested. But at the time, for the small group, that was very valuable. Uh, and then, obviously, CICD, because we talked about that already. And finally, Mattermost. Um, chat ops are very valuable. We're only going to touch on that 
here briefly, but I'm happy to talk, and Inuzue is happy to talk after, to chat ops at any point that, we, that anyone is interested in. So a little bit about this team. Uh, so I was founded this team and worked there for about four years, and Zue can talk to you today, but they do system tools and monitoring. So you can quickly get the idea of systems that spread across the environment. We're talking about thousands of servers. Having a code, having a deployment model uh, is very important. So here's a few of the applications they use on Linux to give you an idea. Remedy, Oracle software, Siebel, um, Confluence. The management tools, satellite, cloud forms, OpenShift, obviously GitLab, and then Puppet is what our infrastructure as code uh, is managed in, and that's all backed by Git. Uh, and then from the monitoring tools, you can kind of see a list. So again, like I said, these are software that needs to get deployed everywhere. If you're trying to log into a machine and install your monitoring agent, RIT 1000, you're never going to be updating it. You're never going to be consistently managed. There's always going to be errors. Uh, by using an infrastructure as code model and having that central code, they write it once, gets deployed across the environment, and away we go and it enables a lot more speed and agility. So quite a few tools. Um, this team's grown a little bit. GitLab has grown too. I checked with Leslie and team yesterday. They have 825 employees now. The team that is running this environment went from one. It's now up to about 10 engineers that run the infrastructure monitoring and some of the core systems management for this federal agency. So I know I kind of went quickly, uh, gave an overview of the environment. The reason to do that is I want to turn it over to Zwei, who's actually going to talk to the things you're really interested in, which is how do we do these things. OK, thank you. It's showing on the other side. OK. Um, so um, just like uh, Scott mentioned, um, for us to uh, manage uh, all these like complexity of the environment, uh, it would be very hard and um, without infrastructure as a code and um, and the other automation. So, um, but having this automation means uh, we have to manage a lot of code, and um, and GitLab provides us a tool to enable those uh, processes to manage this workflow. So, um, so uh, first uh, we can use uh, GitLab as a uh, code repository and a version control, and the second uh, we can also um, use. GitLab CI to um, do, uh, run a verifica verification, validation, and then uh, automated tests. Uh, we can also um, use GitLab uh, uh, CD uh, to uh, deploy to uh, any kind of any environment that we have to uh, development, testing, staging, and prod, um, just everything from the uh, GitLab. So, and I will go over on like how we actually implement those uh, features in our environment. So um, our team has uh, a group, uh, group of uh, GitLab projects uh, where we store our, and keep track of our uh, various files for our uh, application and servers. And we also have all the modules and um, code libraries for our configuration management, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, hardening scripts, uh, file rules, and code libraries. Um, so um, it's actually, we mainly uh, actually, a, um, since we use a Puppet as a uh, um, our configuration tool, it's pretty much uh, a code repo that uh, will work with our Puppet master. Um, so, but even though we uh, use a Puppet, so um, the processes and the approach that we use should be work for any kind of uh, config uh, configuration management tool. So, and uh, this is an example of um, the GitLab uh, repo uh, layout that we uh, use. It's uh, not exactly ours, but just a sample. So, um, so I would like to, um, so we have a, um, so GitLab repo, and a GitLab project, and how do we actually use it? So um, we use a uh, simple GitLab flow. Um, we have a uh, production branch for a production environment, and we have a master uh, for a staging environment. And then we would create um, uh, new additional uh, feature branches for to uh, to develop and test uh, for the new project. Um, so we started with uh, different uh, workflow variations, uh, but we. Um, uh, we came to the conclusion that if we keep it simple, and then um, it would be uh, easy to manage, it would be uh, easy to maintain, and uh, it would be easy to troubleshoot, and e also easy for the user um, who use our um, GitLab um, with a mesh addict. So, and I will go over a um, brief overview on our GitLab flow, um, starting from the test feature branch, and then pushing all the way to, uh, deploying all the way to production. So. Um, 
at first, so we would uh, clone from our, um, we'll clone the new feature branch, uh, we'll clone the master branch, and then we'll create and check out new feature branch from the master, and then uh, we will work on the code, and then um, to and then uh, to update, and then do all uh, add the changes, and then we will commit, we will commit more and often, just like GitLab, uh, get practice, and then if there's any additional uh, changes that we need, we'll, uh, we'll be keep doing it until we get to the point where we're satisfied with our, um, our code, and then uh, uh, when we're ready, and then we will, by then we will uh, push it all the way back to the uh, origin, and then we, that's where we can um, start uh, running the test in our test or dev environment. And then uh, once we're good with the, uh, in our test environment, we would um, march the same uh, feature branch over to the master where, um, and where we can actually run the, um, in the test environment, in, in a staging environment. So, um, so we would uh, march, submit the march request uh, from a feature branch to the master, somebody uh, from a different other team will do the peer review, and then once the code's uh, match requests get uh, reviewed and approved, it will uh, be finally actually deployed to the master environment. So, um, so once we get to the master, and then after we finish with uh, testing and verification, everything in the master branch uh, staging environment, and we'll do the repeat the same steps, but this time we will uh, march, submit match requests from the master to production, um, and then we will. Uh, and then uh, we'll do the same process. That somebody will actually come, uh, actually review the changes, make sure that there's nothing um, going, nothing wrong with the code or nothing uh, uh, affect the production. And then they will review and approve the uh, code to production. And then it will eventually get deployed. Um, so for the, uh, the to blind to uh, production, we use as um, for the we we uh, manually push the code because so that we want to kind of make, uh, control when and uh, how, uh, when exactly that we want to uh, push it out to the production. So we don't automatically uh, deploy. So, um, so now we kind of uh, go over um, how we actually use a code repo and then how we do um, some of our um, deploy out to the various stages, but how do we actually test it? And then what if, um, what if we uh, fix an error and then, and then another error comes up and then we fix it again and it's getting kind of repeating and then uh, it becomes a nightmare. So uh, another thing is, okay, so we push all the way to production, but how do we check uh, the code will actually work and it won't break anything? So, and then that will bring us to our next point for uh, GitLab CI CD and uh, GitLab pipeline. How do we use that? So, um, so I got uh, this uh, picture from GitLab uh, website. So, um, so uh, in the first stage, like whenever we push a code um, from a local repo to feature branch, or master of production, um, that march requests will trigger the, um, the CI pipeline, GitLab CI pipeline. And then in the CI pipeline, it will run through all the various tests of like unit testing, integration testing. And then once, uh, once all the tests have, uh, are um, succeed and pass uh, without any issue, and then it will get to the next stage for the CD pipeline. Uh, and then in there, it will also go through all the, um, the tests, and then, um, and then it will finally um, deploy it to the staging or uh, production or the, any test uh, branch that we want to run the uh, code, and, uh, code in. So, um, and without GitLab CI and CD, um, these would have been jobs and tasks uh, manually um, done by people like us. So by defining those jobs in GitLab um, pipeline, we can uh, automate all those tasks. Um, and then all those jobs for us. And, um, and this, help, this help us uh, avoid making mistakes, reduce human error, and improve our processes uh, over time. So um, how do we actually set up GitLab pipeline? So um, we need to uh, create a, um, a file called .gitlab-ci.yaml um, in our uh, repo root directory. It's a hidden file. But, um, and then in the GitLab-ci.yaml file, we can set up uh, various stages um, and jobs uh, that we want to uh, test uh, for. Uh, and then uh, we, we can define scripts or uh, commands to run on each job. And uh, we can also define variables um, before and after script and uh, needed for the jobs as well. And uh, we can also uh, specify tags, um, but I will go over um, about the tag in uh, later slides. So in this example, um, we have three different stages. We have uh, validation, testing, and deploy, uh, deployment. So. Um, the first stage is to, um, to, um, to validate our code. Um, it will um, go through, it contains the job to make sure our uh, code doesn't have any, um, any typo or any, um, any incorrect, um, incorrect spelling on the, um, 
in the code, and it will also run through the syntax just to make sure um, the code follow um, the, um, the actual uh, code um, standards. And then uh, once and then once that everything is good and green, it will uh, run the next test, which is the testing, where we actually run the unit testing. Um, so in in the second uh, testing stage. Um, uh, we can do. Uh, we can correct. We can define the. Um, we, we can define a test so that it will uh, it will make sure to uh, create or specify the user groups, or it make sure it will um, the code will open up the firewall ports or in the firewall, or it will start the services properly, or um, create the files or directories, or um, configure the configuration. And if all the stages are succeeded, um, it will jump to the next stage for the deployment. And then uh, based on which uh, deployment that we pick, that we choose, it will deploy either to the uh, test of staging or it will deploy to the production environment. So um, I have uh, some example of uh, two completed pipelines. So on the left side, um, you can see all the jobs in each stages. Um, and then they run successfully without any uh, issues and eventually gets deployed. Um, for this, uh, we use continuous deployment, which automatically depo deploys to master branch or any uh, feature branch that you want to test. So there's no um, manual uh, intervention required. It will automatically uh, um, deploy. And on the right side, um, everything is almost exactly the same as the, um, the left image. The only difference is where this is a pipeline to deploy to a production. And then uh, what happens is so, um, so and then once once uh, everything gets pushed and then tested, I mean, fin go through all the tests and everything is good, it will be waiting at the deploy to stage and then, and then we would uh, go through all the, get all the approval that we need and then check everything and then we can, finally someone can manually push the button to deploy the code over to the production. And, uh, but that previous slide, it was everything green and all good, but this slide so um, shows like whenever, when you run into issues. So, in here, you can see like uh, we run into some errors in different various stages. So what happens is like, if you have the error in the first stage, it will not, it will stop there, and then it will not go to the other, uh, other um, stages after. So, so when we run into the issue, we can go into the click on the field jobs up there, and then look, go through the logs, and then fix anything that you need to do, and then and then push it back into the pipeline. It will go through, and then eventually it should. I mean, it will and then we can uh, commit the code and deploy to production or any environment uh, that you need. So um, we won't be able to do any kind of uh, GitLab CI CD without um, using GitLab runners. Um, so just, and then, uh, so GitLab runners are like uh, programmable, programmable robots where you can, um, and you define what kind of tests and things that you want it to do. You write it and the GitLab runners will go and uh, run it for you. So um, the, the runner will follow those instructions and then uh, go through all the tasks. In uh, GitLab CI, uh, um we can add and specify the tags uh, for runners to uh, define which specific stages or jobs that you want to run. So, and then our runner will execute those jobs defined in, in the uh, GitLab CI.yaml and then send success or fail um, test result back to GitLab CI and that's how it can move to the next stage to um, full, uh, run the additional um, stages again. So, and if there's like a specific tag, we can also um, create a specific tag for a specific runner. If you have like, if you have, don't want to uh, share with any other project or task, you can also uh, have a option uh, with using the specific runner as well. So, um, the flexibility with the runner, uh, you can run it on, um, on a physical machine, you can set it up on a VM or a Docker container, and then and then it will still do the same uh, job. So, um, and also we can use uh, GitLab runners with multiple uh, projects or specific projects, and we can also have dedicated runners for specific tasks, or it can be used as a share resources uh, for multiple projects, and uh, it can also run per all uh, parallel tasks, and uh, so you can speed up your um, pipelines, and uh, and then you can also. Um, once after everything is, once uh, once a ru uh, runner runs and uh, finish up its um, testing the job, it can also help you auto uh, auto deploy it to the any environment that you um, that you choose uh, that you specify. So, um, so GitLab runners it will repl it will uh, it help us uh, replace any manual jobs that we would have to do. 
otherwise, and then it can perform all the required tests um, so without us having to do anything. So, and once all the required tests have been successfully checked and verified, it will just, um, a runner will, yeah, deploy to the production. And then on the image on the right, it's kind of tiny, but we cannot, those are the like, so we have the stages, um, whether a green pass or failed. And then on the, uh, the one with the highlighted with the uh, reds are the, the tags that we actually uh, associated to the, each runner to run for each specific task. So some of them has like only one runner, uh, one, one job associated to the runner, and then some has like uh, three tags, three jobs associated, associated to the runner. So um, and next up is uh, Metamost. So uh, we use Metamost as our communication tool, and we can chat with other team members and work on code revisions or brainstorm. And we have various channels, uh, different chat channels for different groups, and uh, we can jump, we can jump into any uh, any of the channels to discover any any configuration management or uh, deployment plan with other team. And uh, we also have GitLab integration with Metamos uh, by using webhooks, so we can define uh, what kind of events that we want to get notified um, to Metamos channel for immediate attention, so that we don't have to kind of catch some someone to approve or review our code. And this was uh, very well with uh, sending out notification during opening the March request, um, when pipeline fails, or when someone approves or uh, March the March request. Um, this uh, concludes my current uh, Git, our current uh, GitLab implementation, and I will go over uh, some of our future uh, plans and implementation with GitLab. So uh, since we're deploying OpenShift uh, platform in our environment, uh, we'll be using heavily on GitLab CI CD pipeline to build, test, and deploy the uh, OpenShift containers. And we can also leverage uh, OpenShift to deploy and uh, run GitLab runners on demand uh, instead of building a separate VM source, separate jobs, and separate um, projects. Um, another uh, new feature we like, we're, uh, excited about is a web IDE. Um, currently, we have to remote into uh, Linux VM with Git client to work and develop on, working on the development. Uh, with a new web IDE, um, this, will enable, uh, this will help us um, start working on the code from the browser um, directly from our uh, workstations. So um, as a final note, uh, I would like to say we learned a lot over the years. Um, CICD definitely is not a plug and play but rather iterative process. We've tried and let tested various methods. Uh, there are a lot of trial and error that you can see, like we tried different uh, pipelines and various tests. Um, so this is only very, um, there are more, but um, uh, so a lot of tra uh, trials and error as we improve a process, but in the end, we're always able to overcome uh, those issues and we're ready for the next challenges and the new features uh, from GitLab. Um, and I would also like to mention uh, it, it takes uh, people that are will, willing to take on the challenges along with the, any tools and um, new tools and technologies uh, available and as well as the management uh, who can understand and lead the way to achieve the goal. And this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to discuss and share about our experience with GitLab if anyone is interested. And thank you. control board or was it up to you to decide when to push the button for production? Uh, yeah, so uh, for the continuous deployment, we already um, have pretty much, because we are not actually pushing it to the production, it's only mm -hmm. at the staging point, staging branch, so we already le leave it um, up to our decision to uh, push it out. Yeah. So for the delivery, the, the right for production, it goes through the change board, and once that approval comes, then it's right. just a simple hit play. And then push it out. Uh, but that gives us future flexibility, or gives this team future flexibility to have the change board process when it becomes more automated. Once that approval comes, then hook back to GitLab. Okay. Question back here. No, it's just recording. Okay. Was it? Hey, um, can you talk a little bit more about any integrations you may have done with Mattermost and what that was like? Okay, so uh, for the Mattermost, so we uh, define like, um, so which projects that we want to get notification. So we go in there and then uh, we would, uh, and then we would get a, um, uh, the, the, the key 
to be able to kind of integrate the metamodes, we can uh, select the um, to enable like there's like an option to enable metamodes integration, and then you would set up the secrets in the metamodes, and then and then um, you can also define what kind of events that you want to uh, get notified on. So you check those, and then and then once you get those set up, it you, you just pre uh, pretty much get a notif yeah notification. So there's like web pet tokens, and then um, the yeah the secrets. Yeah, kind of to expand on that very briefly. Anything that can use webhooks you can integrate into there. So there's that. There's some monitoring tools that can send messages directly into the channels and such. So there are a lot of uh, integration where you can enable and then configure it as you um, need. Yeah. What was this part of your slide at the top before they define the pipeline? Those are um, different. So it's merge in the comment. So that uh, once you set up the CI/CD, uh, how does the next new application? How much you can reuse the setup from the script? Um, how? Yes. Um, so what we do is so since like uh, so uh, for the new application, we will have to write a new code, and since we use a puppet, so I'll just kind of follow that uh, method. So for any application, we will write the same similar script like for whatever. So. For this type of application, so we need this type of packages, we need this type of configuration. So we would configure everything in the um, control repo, and then we would we would also write a test cases. So this co package should exist. This user must exist for this type of services, and then all those we define everything, and then we just it, it will and then it will go through the um, go through the, the various tests that that you um, define for that specific application, right? And then and then we'll just uh, push it. Push it out to the test um, to the test environment, and then make sure everything is installed, configured, and then running as you expect. Expect in the um, the lower environment. So for so any type of application, we'll go through the same process. So and the majority of uh, um, things already exist. So we just have to um, modify the application specific configuration, and then integrate it into the CI/CD pipeline. Yeah. From a practical perspective, it's how c similar your different projects are. If they're very similar, it's going to be cut and paste. If they're like this, if it's infrastructure, that's one language. If it's I'm moving from .NET on Linux and I'm going to be doing Java on Windows, well, you're probably going to have a lot less commonality to your individual CI scripts that will need to get modified. Um, so it's, it's variable. Anything else? Anyone else? Are you guys going to use it? Do you have any plans to leverage groupings and subgroups so you can do cross group pipelines? Yeah. So I think we, that was one of the things we debated and actually cut out. So the infrastructure's code is actually a group and a subgroup um, in GitLab. There's probably 150 repositories that actually make up that environment. So a lot of the things that you saw are group level. Or, or subgroup level, but for keeping it simpler, and I'm sure Zwe or Jonathan, um, who's the team lead on this team now, can get into that in a little more detail afterwards.